In our journey through the annals of England's past, we uncovered the grand saga of the United Kingdom. Today, we embark on a detailed voyage into the Tudor era, a time when the fates of England and Spain were intimately entwined, when the fabric of society was rewoven by religious upheaval, and when figures of immense power and personality shaped the future of a nation. Join us as we delve into the relationships, reforms and rivalries that defined the Tudor reign and forged England's path into the Renaissance and beyond. In 1509, a union that would forever alter the course of English history was celebrated. The marriage of Henry VIII, the vibrant young King of England, to Catherine of Aragon, the Spanish princess of noble heritage. This alliance was not merely a matter of the heart, but a strategic move, weaving together the fates of England and Spain, two of Europe's formidable powers. Initially, their marriage symbolized a strengthening of political ties, promising peace and stability. Catherine, a devout Catholic and the widow of Henry's brother Arthur, brought with her the hope of heirs and the continuation of Tudor lineage, securing the throne's future. As years unfolded, the joyous union of Henry and Catherine was overshadowed by a growing desperation for a male heir. Despite numerous pregnancies, the couple was unable to secure the Tudor succession with a surviving son. This failure began to gnaw at the foundation of their marriage and Henry's faith in his queen. Henry's growing desperation for a male heir to secure his dynasty led him to question the legitimacy of his marriage to his brother's widow, despite the papal dispensation that had allowed it. By the late 1520s, Henry's obsession with securing a male heir drove him to seek an annulment from Catherine, arguing that their marriage had been cursed due to its biblically forbidden nature. The Pope's refusal to annul the marriage influenced by both theological reasons and political pressure from Catherine's nephew, Charles V, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, led Henry to an unprecedented decision. In a bold move that would reshape England's spiritual and political landscape, Henry VIII, with the aid of his advisers, initiated the English Reformation, breaking away from the Catholic Church. This act not only dissolved his marriage to Catherine, but also severed England's ties with Rome establishing the Church of England with the King at its head. The annulment from Catherine of Aragon thus marked the beginning of a religious revolution, setting England on a path of religious reform and conflict that would echo through the centuries. Following Henry VIII's monumental break from the Roman Catholic Church, England embarked on a path of profound religious reform. Under his son, Edward VI, these reforms accelerated, entrenching Protestantism further into the fabric of English society. However, the religious landscape was destined for another seismic shift with the ascension of Mary I in 1553. Mary, unlike her father and half-brother, was a fervent Catholic, determined to undo the Protestant changes that had reshaped England. Her rise to power set the stage for a dramatic reversal of her father's policies. In 1554, Mary I, England's first Queen Regnant, wed Philip II of Spain, forging a union that would once again intertwine the fates of England and Spain. This marriage, far beyond a personal bond, was laden with profound political and religious implications. Mary, a devout Catholic determined to reverse her father Henry VIII's Protestant reforms, saw in Philip, a staunch Catholic monarch, an ally in her mission to restore Catholicism to England. Their union symbolized not just the merging of two royal houses, but a concerted effort to steer England back to the Catholic fold. The marriage of Mary and Philip marked the beginning of a fervent campaign to re-establish Catholic dominance in England. With the Queen's zeal and the King's support, England witnessed the revival of Catholic practices and the suppression of Protestantism. The Marian persecutions, a dark chapter in England's religious history, saw the execution of hundreds of Protestants, earning Mary the moniker Bloody Mary. This period of religious turmoil deepened the rift between Catholics and Protestants, setting the stage for enduring conflict. The couple's inability to produce an heir and Philip's frequent absences from England further fueled public discontent, casting a shadow over their reign. Though Mary I and Philip II's marriage sought to firmly re-anchor England to Catholicism, their efforts bore temporary fruit. Mary's death in 1558 without an heir and Philip's waning influence over English affairs led to the ascension of Elizabeth I, Mary's Protestant half-sister. Under Elizabeth's reign, 
England would decisively turn back to Protestantism, solidifying the religious transformation initiated by Henry VIII. The union of Mary and Philip, while momentarily swaying England's religious direction towards Catholicism, ultimately set the stage for a Protestant England, with the Catholic flame extinguished upon Mary's death. This chapter in English history underscores the complex interplay of marriage, religion and politics on the tumultuous seas of European affairs. In 1534, a pivotal moment unfolded within the storied halls of English governance, forever altering the spiritual landscape of the kingdom. The act of supremacy, meticulously crafted and boldly enacted, declared Henry VIII not only as the sovereign ruler of England, but also as the supreme head of the Church of England. This legislative masterstroke effectively severed England's centuries-old ties with the Roman Catholic Church and the papal authority, laying the foundation for a national church under royal control. With the passage of the Act of Supremacy, Henry VIII embarked on a comprehensive reformation of England's religious institutions. The dissolution of the monasteries not only dismantled the power of the Catholic Church within the kingdom, but also redistributed vast ecclesiastical wealth and lands to the crown and its loyalists. Churches across England, once aligned with Rome, now preached the doctrines of the Church of England, guided by a new liturgy that echoed the king's authority. While many embraced the change, Viewing it as a liberation from papal dominion, others whispered prayers of dissent, clinging to their old faith in the shadows. The establishment of the Church of England under the Act of Supremacy was an act of religious defiance and a declaration of national sovereignty. Henry VIII's bold move redefined the relationship between the Crown and the Church, intertwining faith with royal authority. As England charted its course through the turbulent waters of European politics and religion, the break with Rome signalled its emergence as a state with the autonomy to dictate its spiritual and temporal destiny. Yet this seismic shift also sowed the seeds of future conflicts, as the rift between Catholics and Protestants deepened, setting the stage for generations of religious and political strife. In the midst of Henry VIII's complex marital history, his court was engulfed in a storm of change and controversy, largely driven by his troubled marriage to his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Anne, a charismatic and intelligent courtier, caught the king's eye, setting in motion events that would forever alter the course of English history. Their union in 1533, following Henry's contentious divorce from Catherine of Aragon and the subsequent break with the Roman Catholic Church, marked the beginning of England's journey toward religious reformation. Anne Boleyn's fall from grace was swift and brutal. Despite initially being celebrated for her role in the king's marital and religious upheaval, her failure to provide a male heir and rumours of her infidelity sowed seeds of doubt in Henry's mind. In 1536, Anne was arrested and charged with adultery, incest and high treason, accusations widely believed to be fabricated by her political enemies. Her trial, a foregone conclusion, culminated in her execution, an event that sent shockwaves through the kingdom and underscored the perilous nature of life at Henry's court. The execution of Anne Boleyn left England in a state of unease, with the king's quest for a male successor and religious legitimacy casting long shadows over the realm. The court, still reeling from the swift justice meted out to Anne, awaited Henry's next move with bated breath. It was within this atmosphere of uncertainty and yearning for change that Jane Seymour, a lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn, emerged as the next candidate for Queen Consort. Her introduction promised a new direction for Henry's reign, and a hopeful future for the Tudor dynasty. In the wake of Anne Boleyn's tragic fall, the English court was ripe for change. Enter Jane Seymour, a beacon of hope and stability in the turbulent sea of Henry VIII's matrimonial ventures. Married in 1536, just days after Anne's execution, Jane's quiet dignity and grace offered a stark contrast to the drama that had unfolded before her. Her marriage to Henry VIII promised a fresh start, a chance to heal the wounds of the past and secure the future of the Tudor dynasty. The year 1537 brought with it the fulfilment of Henry VIII's most fervent wish, the birth of a male heir, Edward. The kingdom rejoiced, seeing in the young prince the promise of continuity and stability for the Tudor lineage. Jane Seymour, the queen who achieved what her predecessors could not, was celebrated across the land. Her role in providing an heir not only endeared her to Henry, but also elevated the Seymour family's status within the royal court, 
marking them as indispensable pillars of the Tudor dynasty. Tragedy struck swiftly on the heels of triumph. Jane Seymour's health deteriorated rapidly after Edward's birth, a cruel twist of fate that cast a shadow over the recent celebrations. Despite the best efforts of the royal physicians, Jane passed away on October 24, 1537, just 12 days after bringing the long-awaited prince into the world. Her death plunged Henry into genuine mourning, marking the end of what many considered his happiest marriage. Jane's legacy, however, lived on in her son and in the enduring stability she briefly brought to the Tudor court. In the years that followed, Jane Seymour's influence persisted, not only as the mother of the future King Edward VI, but also as a symbol of the peace and hope she had represented. Henry's mourning for Jane was profound, never fully dissipating even as he married again. Jane's quiet dignity and her critical role in securing the Tudor succession left an indelible mark on the annals of English history. Her son, Edward, would ascend the throne as a living proof of her legacy, embodying the hope for a prosperous and stable reign that Jane had once heralded. The marriage of Jane Seymour to Henry VIII and the birth of Edward VI dramatically transformed the fortunes of the Seymour family. From Jane's brothers, Edward and Thomas, to her extended kin, the Seymours capitalized on their newfound prominence, securing influential positions and forming advantageous alliances. Their rise reflected not only the power of proximity to the throne, but also the lasting impact of Jane Seymour's brief but significant tenure as queen. In her, the Tudor court found a figure of unity and the promise of continuity, a legacy that would endure far beyond her own time. Upon the ascension of the young Edward VI, Jane Seymour's brother, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, assumed the role of Lord Protector, steering the kingdom during the king's minority. His tenure was marked by ambitious attempts to further the Protestant Reformation initiated by Henry VIII and to implement social reforms. However, Edward Seymour's regency was fraught with challenges as he navigated a landscape riddled with political intrigue and opposition from rival nobles. His efforts to consolidate power and advance religious reforms ultimately led to his downfall. Following Edward Seymour's fall from grace, England continued on a path of religious and political tumult. The young king, Edward VI reign, though short-lived, was a period of continued Protestant reform, shaping the religious landscape that Elizabeth I would inherit. Edward's death in 1553 plunged the kingdom into a brief succession crisis, ultimately leading to Mary the first ascension to the throne. Mary's reign sought to reverse the Protestant advances, reinstating Catholicism and sparking division within the kingdom. Her death in 1558 opened the door for Elizabeth I, marking the beginning of a new chapter in England's history. Elizabeth's rise to power was a pivotal moment that would define the future of the nation, bridging the tumult of her siblings' reigns with the promise of stability and prosperity. The Seymour's chapter in Tudor history is a tale of ascent and ambition, marked by Jane Seymour's marriage to Henry VIII and her brother Edward's regency. This period saw the intertwining of personal ambitions with the broader currents of English religious and political life, highlighting the profound impact of individual figures and families on the course of history. The Seymour's legacy, encapsulated in the reign of Edward VI and the Protestant reforms they championed, remains a significant proof of their influence during one of England's most transformative eras. In November 1558, the death of Mary I, known for her staunch Catholicism and efforts to reverse England's Protestant reforms, marked a turning point in English history. Elizabeth, daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, ascended the throne on November 17, 1558, amidst a kingdom fraught with religious division and political uncertainty. Elizabeth's rise to power was not merely a succession, it was a restoration of the Protestant faith to the English crown. Her Protestant beliefs, directly in contrast to her half-sister Mary, the first Catholic convictions, set the stage for a reign defined by religious and political navigation. Elizabeth's accession promised a return to her father's Reformation policies, igniting hope among Protestants and concern among Catholic monarchs across Europe. Elizabeth the First Ascension represented a turning point, marking the onset of her era, a time renowned for its cultural renaissance, maritime exploration and consolidation of the Protestant Reformation. The challenges faced by Edward Seymour and the shifts during Edward VI and Mary I reigns 
set the stage for Elizabeth's monumental task. To unite a kingdom divided by religious strife and to navigate the complex web of international politics. Her reign would come to embody a golden age of English history, built upon the tumultuous but transformative years that preceded it. Understanding the delicate balance of power and the need for religious unity, Elizabeth I moved swiftly to implement her religious settlement in 1559. This series of laws aimed to establish a Church of England that was Protestant in doctrine, but retained many elements of Catholic ritual in an effort to appease both sides of the religious divide. In the latter half of the 16th century, Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, emerged as a significant figure in the complex landscape of English and Scottish history. A Catholic and a direct descendant of the Tudor line, Mary's claim to the English throne posed a considerable threat to Elizabeth I, her Protestant cousin and reigning monarch of England. Mary's arrival in England in 1568, fleeing turmoil in Scotland, did not just mark the entry of a queen seeking refuge, but also that of a rival who personified the aspirations of Catholic Europe to see England return to the Catholic fold. As Mary lived under watchful eyes in England, the undercurrents of political intrigue grew stronger. Elizabeth's spymaster, Francis Walsingham, orchestrated an intricate network of espionage that ultimately implicated Mary in a series of plots to overthrow Elizabeth and restore Catholic rule. The Babington Plot of 1586, a scheme to assassinate Elizabeth and place Mary on the throne, became the turning point. Despite the murky evidence and Mary's vehement denials, the discovery of this plot sealed her fate, convincing Elizabeth and her advisers of Mary's perennial threat to Protestant England's stability. On February 8, 1587, Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots, faced her executioner at Fotheringhay Castle, marking a tragic end to a queen caught in the crossfires of dynastic ambition and religious strife. Her death, decreed by Elizabeth reluctantly, but deemed necessary for the realm's security, sent ripples through England and beyond. The execution of a Catholic queen, anointed and sovereign, deepened the schism between Catholics and Protestants, hardening the resolve of Catholic monarchs against England, but also solidifying Elizabeth's rule. Mary's execution, while eliminating a direct threat to Elizabeth, underscored the relentless shadow of religious conflict that would continue to shape the destinies of nations. Mary Stuart's tragic demise was more than the fall of a queen. It was a watershed moment in the religious and political saga of Britain. Her life and death encapsulated the era's tumult, embodying the strife that defined the age. The execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, quelled a political threat to Elizabeth I and amplified the Catholic-Protestant tensions, echoing through history as a stark reminder of the era's relentless religious fervor and the lengths to which rulers would go to protect their throne. In this chapter of history, the scaffold at Fotheringhay became the altar on which the fragile peace of an era was sacrificed, leaving a legacy of division and defiance that would endure for generations. In the intricate web of politics during Queen Elizabeth's reign, few threads were as crucial to the fabric of the realm as those woven by William Cecil, Lord Burghley, and his son, Robert Cecil. William, appointed as Elizabeth I Secretary of State at the onset of her reign in 1558, was the architect of her domestic and foreign policies, serving the Queen with unwavering loyalty for over four decades. His wisdom and political acumen helped navigate England through the treacherous waters of international diplomacy and religious unrest. William Cecil, Lord Burghley, was a master strategist whose vigilance and foresight preserved Elizabeth's throne amidst constant threats. From the Northern Rebellion of 1569 to the Babington Plot of 1586, Cecil's intelligence network was instrumental in uncovering conspiracies against the Crown. His commitment to Protestantism guided the religious course of Elizabeth's reign, ensuring the Church of England's establishment against Catholic opposition. Moreover, his economic policies laid the groundwork for England's prosperity, balancing the royal treasury while fostering growth and exploration. Following in his father's footsteps, Robert Cecil emerged as a key advisor to Elizabeth I, especially in the twilight of her reign. His keen political insight and diplomatic skill were paramount in navigating England through internal challenges and external threats. Robert's crowning achievement lay in his orchestration of the seamless transition of power from Elizabeth to James I, 
ensuring the stability of the realm after Elizabeth's death. His negotiation of the Treaty of London in 1604, ending the protracted Anglo-Spanish War, was a clear proof of his diplomatic prowess, heralding a new era of peace for England. The Cecils, father and son, were the linchpins of, of the governance during Queen Elizabeth's reign, their sage council, and strategic planning securing the legacy of one of England's greatest monarchs. Their unwavering service and the pivotal roles they played as advisors to Elizabeth I shaped the course of English history, steering the nation through periods of peril and prosperity. In the annals of Queen Elizabeth's England, the Cecils stand as architects of an era, their influence echoing through the corridors of power long after their time. In 1577, under the watchful eyes of an expectant nation, Sir Francis Drake embarked on a voyage destined to etch his name into the annals of history. Commanding the Golden Hind, he set sail from Plymouth, England, venturing into the unknown with a crew brimming with anticipation and apprehension. Their mission, cloaked in the guise of exploration, carried the unspoken goal of challenging Spanish supremacy on the high seas. The Golden Hind became a spectre on the seas for Spanish colonies and vessels, with Drake's boldness and cunning bringing him face to face with unimaginable wealth. Each successful raid filled England's coffers and sent a clear message. The seas were no longer Spain's undisputed domain. In 1580, after circumnavigating the globe, Drake returned to England, transforming from a daring seafarer into a national hero. His knighthood, awarded by Queen Elizabeth I herself, was a symbol not only to his bravery and skill, but also to the strategic blow he had dealt to Spanish pride and power. The Golden Hind, now a symbol of English naval prowess, anchored Drake's legacy as one of history's greatest navigators and privateers. Sir Francis Drake's circumnavigation was a harbinger of change, signaling the rise of England as a formidable naval power. The wealth accrued and the challenge posed to Spain's supremacy emboldened England, setting the stage for future conflicts and explorations. Drake's legacy, marked by courage, audacity, and a vision of a world accessible to English ships, ignited a flame of maritime ambition that would burn brightly for centuries, forever altering the course of British history. In 1588, a dark shadow loomed over England as the formidable Spanish Armada set its sights on the island nation. This fleet, the largest military force ever assembled at sea up to that time, aimed to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I and restore Catholic rule. England braced for an invasion that threatened its very existence as the Spanish fleet, a symbol of the mightiest empire on earth, sailed closer. As the Spanish Armada neared, Sir Francis Drake and England's naval leaders prepared to confront this unprecedented threat. Despite the odds, Drake's confidence and strategic foresight galvanized the English Navy. With a mix of experienced seafarers and innovative tactics, England was not to be underestimated. Queen Elizabeth, in a show of indomitable spirit, rallied her people with stirring speeches, declaring their readiness to defend their homeland and way of life. On the eve of battle, Drake's mastery of naval warfare shone brilliantly. The English launched fire ships, turning the night sea into a tableau of fire and fear. These unmanned flaming vessels, directed at the tightly packed Spanish galleons, caused panic and confusion. The mighty armada, constrained by its rigid formation, was forced to scatter, compromising its strength and unity. Drake's audacious tactic underscored the ingenuity that would define this historic confrontation. In the battle's aftermath, the English fleet, leveraging their ship's agility, harried the disoriented Spanish armada. The smaller, more maneuverable English vessels unleashed a relentless barrage, exploiting the weaknesses exposed by their initial strategy. The armada, beleaguered by the English offensive and battered by fierce storms, faced a disastrous retreat around Scotland and Ireland. The once invincible fleet limped back to Spain, diminished and defeated. The defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588 marked a pivotal moment in world history, marking England's ascent as a preeminent naval power. This victory, masterminded by the likes of Sir Francis Drake, not only safeguarded England's independence, but also reshaped the balance of naval supremacy. The triumph over Spain bolstered national pride and ignited an era of exploration and expansion that would see England's influence spread across the globe. 
The legacy of this battle, a symbol of courage, innovation and unity, would echo through the centuries, defining the spirit of a nation poised on the brink of a new age. Sir Francis Drake's contributions to naval warfare extended beyond his lifetime, marking a new era where mobility, firepower and daring strategy defined naval engagements. His circumnavigation proved the value of extensive maritime knowledge and advanced ship design, leading to innovations that would empower the English Navy for centuries. Drake's legacy was not merely in the gold he seized or the battles he won, but in the indomitable spirit of exploration and combat he instilled in England. His impact on naval warfare and the course of English history secured his place as one of the most influential figures of Queen Elizabeth's era. Sir Francis Drake, the Seahawk, remains a towering figure in the annals of maritime history, symbolizing the age of exploration and the rise of English naval power. His daring circumnavigation, pivotal role in defeating the Spanish Armada, and lasting impact on naval warfare, embody the spirit of an era where the sea was the stage for power, conflict, and discovery. Drake's legacy, marked by courage, innovation, and patriotism, continues to inspire tales of adventure and the pursuit of glory on the high seas. In the late 1580s, the tension between Protestant England and Catholic Spain reached its zenith. King Philip II of Spain, incensed by English raids on Spanish ships and England's support for Protestant rebels in the Spanish Netherlands, embarked on a monumental endeavor to invade England. In 1588, he launched the Spanish Armada, a formidable fleet of ships, tasked with overthrowing Queen Elizabeth I and restoring Catholicism. Across the Channel, England braced for the onslaught, under the leadership of Elizabeth and her seasoned commanders, including Sir Francis Drake. The nation stood united, ready to defend its sovereignty and faith against the impending invasion. The battle in the English Channel was a spectacle of naval strategy and bravery. The English fleet, outnumbered but not outmaneuvered, employed hit-and-run tactics against the Spanish behemoths. The introduction of fire ships on the night of August 7th, eight hellburners sent adrift into the anchored Spanish fleet, sowed chaos and fear among the Spanish sailors. The Armada, caught off guard, was forced to cut their anchors, scattering in disarray. The English Navy seized the opportunity, harrying the Spanish ships up the channel. The aftermath of the battle saw the Spanish Armada battered, not only by the English Navy, but by fierce storms as it fled northward around Scotland and Ireland. The treacherous journey resulted in the loss of many ships and lives, a humbling defeat for Spain, once deemed invincible on the seas. England, in contrast, emerged victorious, its naval prowess and national spirit galvanized by the conflict. The defeat of the Armada was celebrated as a divine deliverance, with Elizabeth I crediting the Protestant wind for scattering her enemies. The event marked a turning point, establishing England as a dominant naval power and marking the decline of Spanish maritime dominance. The Spanish Armada's defeat in 1588 stands as a landmark event in military history, symbolizing the shift in European power dynamics and the rise of England as a sovereign maritime nation. It was not merely a battle won, but a declaration of England's resilience, innovation and unity in the face of existential threat. The legacy of the Armada, with its tales of heroism, strategy and the capricious nature of fate, continues to resonate, a clear proof of the enduring spirit of a nation and its people. In the waning years of the 16th century, the court of Elizabeth I witnessed the rise of a perilous undercurrent, centering around Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Once a favored courtier of the Queen, Essex's meteoric rise was marred by his equally swift fall from grace. By 1601, driven by a dangerous cocktail of disenchantment and ambition, Essex embarked on a daring, ill-fated rebellion against the monarch who had once showered him with titles and lands. His plan, to seize control of London and compel Elizabeth to reform her government and council, purging them of his rivals. On the morning of February 8, 1601, Essex and his band of rebels made their desperate move, marching into London with the aim of igniting a popular uprising against the Queen. Yet the city did not rise as Essex had hoped. London's streets remained eerily calm, its citizens wary of joining a cause that seemed as treacherous as it was doomed. The rebellion, poorly planned and lacking widespread support, quickly unraveled, leaving Essex and his followers to face the grim consequences of their treason. 
The rebellion's failure led to the swift capture and trial of Robert Devereux, the Earl of Essex. Despite his previous closeness to Elizabeth, Essex was found guilty of treason, a crime that carried the gravest of penalties. On February 25th, 1601, Essex met his end on the scaffold, a stark example of the peril of challenging the Tudor monarchy. His execution not only marked the demise of the last great favorite of Elizabeth I, but also signaled the end of an era, as the aging queen faced the twilight of her reign without the charismatic, though ultimately rebellious, Earl by her side. The Essex plot of 1601, a dramatic coda to Queen Elizabeth's reign, serves as a poignant reminder of the volatile mix of ambition, loyalty and power within the Tudor court. Robert Devereux's ill-starred rebellion against Elizabeth I encapsulates the tensions and turmoil of a period that, while celebrated for its cultural renaissance, was also marked by political intrigue and personal tragedy. In the shadow of Essex's fall, the era of Elizabeth I drew to a close, marking the transition to a new dynasty and the enduring legacy of Tudor England. Our journey through the untold chapters of the Tudor era has revealed a multifaceted panorama of intrigue, ambition and transformation. By filling the gaps left in our initial exploration, we've gained a deeper appreciation for the complexities and nuances of this pivotal period in English history. The Tudor dynasty, through its battles and betrayals, marriages and reforms, not only shaped the course of the nation, but also left an indelible mark on England's religious, political and cultural landscape. From the establishment of the Church of England to the foundation of modern British governance and exploration, the Tudors catalyzed changes that propelled England into a new era of Renaissance and Reformation, echoing through the corridors of time to influence countless generations. If this voyage through the Tudor dynasty's untold stories has captivated your imagination and broadened your understanding, we invite you to join our community of history enthusiasts. Like this video to support our endeavors into the past, share it with fellow history buffs, and subscribe to our channel for more deep dives into the events and figures that have shaped our world. Your engagement helps us uncover more stories, unearthing the lessons and legacies that history has to offer. Together, let's keep the past alive, exploring the mysteries and marvels that await in history's depths. Thank you for being part of this journey. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep exploring.